This month on In the Life, we're celebrating our 10th anniversary with these stories on today's gay and lesbian issues. It took Rosie O'Donnell's coming out to bring national attention to the Florida law that prohibits gays and lesbians from adopting children. Today, we'll meet some men and women who are fighting for the right to become parents. I don't think America knows what a gay parent looks like. I am the gay parent. From Hello Dolly to La Fo, composer and lyricist Jerry Herman has been writing Broadway hits for over 40 years. We'll meet the man behind the music, as well as some of the fabulous women in his life. The most exciting thing in the world, and Jerry was overjoyed. I mean, you never knew anybody who was more supportive of an actress at that moment than Jerry. Vibe magazine is the bible for urban culture and hip-hop music, which is often seen as a homophobic music genre. We'll go behind the scenes with Vibe's editor-in-chief, Emil Wilbekin, who's changing that perception one column at a time. And then some of the letters were from gay black men who were mad that I outed them, that I outed the culture. Plus, Andy Hum goes out and about to bring you the latest news and cultural happenings. And Harvey Firestein takes a trip back to his old hood in this month's Outtakes. All this and more on the 10th anniversary edition of In the Life. In the Life is funded in part by the H. Van Ameringen Foundation. Additional support provided by the Gill Foundation, the Pride Foundation, the Ted Snowden Foundation, the Otto Haas Charitable Trust, the Collingwood Foundation, the Reed Williams Foundation, William J. Resnick, Michael A. Leppin, Richard Winger Fund of Stonewall Community Foundation, and the annual support of In the Life members like you. Welcome to the show, I'm Katherine Linton. Over the past decade, we've been proud to bring you the news, trends, and groundbreaking issues that affect the gay and lesbian community worldwide. Tonight's first story is about doing whatever it takes to create a family. And one of the hottest topics in this arena right now is Florida's anti-gay adoption law. Correspondent Jonathan Capehart reports on the fight for the right to adopt. Rosie O'Donnell outed herself on national television to draw attention to a Florida law that prohibits gays and lesbians from adopting children. Rosie, who has dual residency in New York and Miami, has created a family with her partner, Kelly Carpenter, and their three adopted children. But recently, Rosie faced a harsh reality. Under Florida law, she can never adopt the child she once fostered because she's gay. I don't think America knows what a gay parent looks like. I am the gay parent. While Rosie O'Donnell's activism will likely help the movement to change Florida's anti-gay law, Florida's growing population of gay families has been suffering silently. The reason is a 25-year-old law that singles out gays and lesbians. It reads, quote, no person who is otherwise eligible under this statute can adopt if he or she is a homosexual. Sexuality is not a precursor to good parenting. In 1997, a county judge refused to rule the ban unconstitutional, and in 1999, the ACLU filed the first federal civil lawsuit on behalf of foster parents Steve Lofton and Roger Croteau. It was thrown out of court and is now on appeal. Florida's ban on adoption by lesbians and gay men violates the guaranteed equal protection under the law of the United States Constitution. The law targets lesbians and gay men and no one else singles them out for exclusion from adoption despite the fact there is that there is no reason to believe that lesbians and gay men can't be and aren't good parents ironically the state allows gays and lesbians to become certified foster parents they simply can't legally adopt the foster children they have nurtured the ACLU's case against the state involves three plaintiffs all who charge that the law is unconstitutional these families stand to lose children they've fostered since birth, and all of the plaintiffs are facing the reality that they can never create the kind of long-term stability for these children adoption can provide. Steve Lofton and Roger Croteau, partners for more than 17 years, stand to lose 11-year-old Bert, a child who has been with them since birth. He was born HIV positive, as were the rest of their foster kids. But now that Bert is HIV negative, the state says it wants to find him a permanent heterosexual home. I would hope that 
no one who would call himself or herself a child welfare professional would dare rip a child away from the only family he's ever known his whole life. The law dates back to 1977, when entertainer Anita Bryant spearheaded an anti-gay crusade. Her movement was successful, and the Florida legislature passed the law by a sweeping margin. Nobody knew who was gay or lesbian at the time. No one was out. This was 1977, 25 years ago, and it was a completely different environment. Elaine Bloom, a conservative Democrat with an 18-year history of promoting fairness, was one of those legislators who voted in favor of the ban, a vote she now regrets. I had to go back, search through all my old House journals, and it's easily, it's there, you know, once you see the record. I think it was May 31st, 1977. So I did it, and I'm sorry. Elaine has personally set out to convince her fellow legislators to admit they made a mistake, too and stand behind repealing the law. I talked to some of my former colleagues and said, we have an opportunity to at least go public with our own views now. Do you agree to a statement that says in 1977 we made a mistake on this particular vote because it denied children the opportunity for loving, supportive families? Elaine didn't know it then, but her son David was gay, and she had just enacted a law that could affect him years later. I feel remiss is that I have never discussed with my mother that bill in 1977. I never asked her how she voted. David and his partner had their son using a surrogate when they lived in New York, a state where there are no laws prohibiting gays and lesbians from second parent adoptions. They recently moved to Florida, where the adoption ban has no effect on them, but it does on other gays and lesbians raising kids in Florida. You know about Steve and Roger and their struggle to keep Bert but other gay families are hurting too. I could practically cry on camera when I think about the kids that are literally sitting in institutions in Florida, not being able to replace any of the days that go by while we allow this, the law to stay on the books. It's just, it breaks my heart. It's just so wrong. Wayne LaRue Smith and Dan Scan are also plaintiffs in the ACLU lawsuit. They've been together for nearly 10 years and live in Florida's Key West. For the past three years, they've opened their doors to the state's foster children. They also charge that the law is unconstitutional and labels them unfit parents. We saw 11 children through our house now in the foster care system, and each of them had their own individual problems of neglect, abuse, or abandonment that we had to deal with. And bringing those kids around is one of the most difficult jobs I've ever encountered. Wayne and Dan are currently taking care of two little boys whose identities we have to protect. The toughest part is learning what they've been through that brought them here. Our main goal with our children is providing them safety in our home. This is their safe place. They don't have to fear anything when they're here. My greatest hope is to have just made a difference, no matter how small or how large, in their lives. We literally have a white picket fence, okay? And everything that stands for is what our home is about. I tell people that probably the biggest reason we're involved in this lawsuit is because we are 100% in favor of family values and white picket fences. The American Psychological Association, the American Academy of Pediatrics, and the Child Welfare League disagree with those who say homosexuals shouldn't be allowed to adopt. What the state of Florida truly is saying is that people who are gay or lesbian or uh, bisexual are wonderful people to take care of foster children who have no other place to be placed, and yet you can't place them for permanent uh, adoption. It doesn't make any sense. There are currently more than 3,400 kids waiting to be adopted in the state of Florida. Right now, 400 of them are being raised in gay or lesbian foster homes. And given the chance, the majority would adopt the children they are fostering. If the gay adoption ban is repealed, the hopeful byproduct would be that you'd have more people seeking to adopt children. People like Steve and Roger, Wayne and Dan, and of course, Rosie. It was here, at Florida's Gladstone Center in South Miami, a safe haven for abused girls, where Rosie was inspired to become a licensed foster parent. 
She was so moved by the place um, and she was so moved by the mission um, of caring and the um, high level of quality that the kids receive here that she wanted to become more involved. That meant getting licensed to foster children in the state of Florida. And nowhere on that application does it ask the question, are you a homosexual? I call it the big don't ask, don't tell conspiracy. The impact of Florida's anti-gay adoption law reaches far beyond foster parenting. It also prevents gay and lesbian couples the right to seek second parent adoptions. Robin Singer and Zibby Giardina of Fort Lauderdale, Florida, together for more than 13 years, decided to have their own children. Robin is the biological parent through donor insemination. The issue becomes, obviously, if God forbid something happens to me, the kids, um, you know, really in the real world are sort of up for grabs. Legally, she has no right, you know, it's out of our hands. I mean, morally, there are children in our hearts, in our family, and nobody can change that, irrespective of what the, the laws may or may not say. Oh, they call me Mom Z, I'm Mom Z. They're as much my children as they are Robin's children. I chose to um, give them Zibby's last name because it was the only piece that I could give her to connect, you know, the, the puzzle pieces. Zibby did try to obtain legal guardianship of her children, but was advised that it would be a long and costly court battle, one that she would never win. I have no ground to stand on at all in this state, in the state of Florida. The Florida law prevents these second parent adoptions from taking place and means that children are, who otherwise could benefit from having two legally responsible parents only can have one. But there are ways around the Florida law. When Naomi Parker adopted her daughter, Jamera, from the state of New Jersey, she found a loophole. Because Jamera's legal place of birth and residence was in the state of New Jersey, uh, Florida couldn't do anything about it. So it was a, like a more of a slam dunk in the state of Florida's face. Jamera was a crack baby, and at 22 months, she had already been in five foster homes. Today, she is a thriving nine-year-old. Naomi and her partner, Susan, are also caring for Naomi's biological daughter, Bria. They are not only fighting for the day they can give Jamera the benefits of two legal parents, they are fighting for the rights of all gays and lesbians who want to create families without having to circumvent the law. In the meantime, they try not to worry about the underlying threat the law poses to Jamera's safety. I wish, like, the law will change, and so it will protect me and my sister. Mm, I agree with Bria that I will hope to see the law change to myself to protect me and my sister and our family. The courts in Florida have not historically been sympathetic to the gay community, but the fate of the adoption law is now in the hands of the 11th Circuit Court of Appeals. Elaine Bloom's efforts to bring the law before the Florida legislature next spring will help the case for gay and lesbian adoption. So will Rosie O'Donnell's support and visibility. So now people have a face to the name Definitely. of what a gay parent is, and it's Rosie O'Donnell. For her to be so brave to put her face on a very important issue that has so personally affected my family, I find it just absolutely commendable. She's, a parent. she's not someone coming in from the outside, right. um, or she's not just a spokesperson, but she's someone who wanted to adopt a child in Florida and couldn't because of the law. It also seems somewhat poetic that since the law was initially urged and championed by a celebrity, Anita Bryant. It seems that now the law should die with a celebrity urging the cause to kill it. Don't let these children suffer without a family because of your bias, because of Anita Bryant's hate-filled rhetoric. Right now, all eyes might be on Florida, but Utah and Mississippi also have laws preventing gay couples from adopting and there are six other states considering similar bans. For In the Life, I'm Jonathan Capehart. Later in the show, hip-hop music and its culture have long been seen as homophobic. 
we'll get a different view through the eyes of Vibe Magazine's editor-in-chief, Emil Wilbekin. I would have the power to change those perceptions and open up people's eyes. But coming up next, an interview with an original Broadway baby. Christmas now. Hola amigos, soy Albita y ustedes están mirando el programa que ha sido nominado para un Emmy, In the Life. The Broadway musical has been around longer than hip hop, disco, or even rock and roll. And one of its legends, Jerry Herman, helped put the great in the great white way. Correspondent Daniel Karslake takes a look at this remarkable man and his extraordinary career. For more than 40 years, the work of Broadway's Jerry Herman has defined the great American musical. In fact, he's the only composer lyricist in Broadway history to have had three of his musicals, Hello Dolly, Mame, and La Caja Folle, run for more than 1,500 performances each. In a rare interview, Jerry, who was literally born on Broadway, talks about his incredible life in the theater. I was born in a hospital room where my mother's window overlooked the marquee of the Winter Garden Theater. And of course, she had no idea that 34 years later, her son's musical Mame would be emblazoned on that marquee. It is probably a cliche to have a gay son who thinks his mother is the most glamorous, wonderful thing in the world. But my mother, Ruth, was all of those things. She was a piano player and singer. She had her own radio show before I was born. My parents loved the musical theater. And the night I, they took me to Annie Get Your Gun, they really created a monster. It really was a turning point. From that moment on, I knew that if there was one dream that I had, it was to write songs like Irving Berlin wrote and to give the gift of music to other people the way he had given it to me. So Jerry pursued his dream to write music, and through his teens and 20s, he honed his craft, writing songs for reviews and small off-Broadway shows. With the premiere of his first Broadway musical, Milk and Honey, in 1961, everything started to change. It got wonderful reviews, and I got nominated for a Tony Award. And I was really swept away. Following the success of Milk and Honey, Jerry was asked by Broadway impresario David Merrick and director Gower Champion to work on a new musical based on Thornton Wilder's play, The Matchmaker. It was to be called Hello, Dolly. I had written the score for Ethel Merman, and when it came time to play it for Ethel, she announced that she never wanted to do another Broadway show. I was devastated, of course, because that was my my idol and my goal was to, you know, to have her in a show of mine. But Gower said, I have an idea. I worked with a woman named Carol Channing in a review called Lend an Ear. And I think she can be marvelous in this role. Well, it changed my whole life. It was truly love at first sight for both of us. He really was gorgeous. It was love at first sight. And Jerry insists it was mutual. Now you know. I mean, really. Here I had a score that was written for Ethel Merman, and so all of Ethel's what we call money notes, you know, those high C's, were way out of Carol's range. And to break the ice, I said, Carol, I've always wanted to hear these songs way down in the register that the men sing in. He said, I want Mother Earth. That's what I want. And he said, that's the way I conceived it, and that's the way I always wanted it. He lied in his teeth. No composer wants his song sung down there. And we did it anyway, and I relaxed completely because, and I just said, hello, Harry. Well, hello, Louis. I did do a lot of changing for Carol. And 
all to the good. We hugged and we laughed and we have ne never stopped laughing. It was a partnership that worked because when Hello Dolly opened on Broadway on January 19th, 1964, it was a smash hit. It was the hit of the decade. We won not only 10 Tony Awards and Grammy Awards, but Drama Critics Awards. I had no idea that I was about to follow it with another experience that was as, as satisfying or more satisfying, uh, a little thing called Mame. We were searching for a lady to play Mame. And we had, at this point, honestly seen every lady who was breathing in New York City. I had just done a tremendously exciting musical called Anyone Can Whistle, written by Stephen Sondheim, which had run for exactly nine performances and had closed. So I went home to California with my tail between my legs. I remember this stunning lady, who of course I knew as a great screen actress, belting out a Sondheim song, and she knocked me out of my seat. And so I picked up the phone and I called our producers. Uh, uh, and I said, I found, I found our main. The producers were hesitant to even audition Lansbury because she was best known for playing matronly roles in films, certainly not for being a glamorous leading lady. But Jerry insisted. And a few days later, there at my front door, was this tall, elegant lady in a mink coat. And I took one look at her. It was the first time I'd ever seen her in person. And I, and I, my heart stopped for a minute because I knew that that was Mame. What was afoot was a huge Broadway musical, which Jerry had written. And he, the, the only one at this point, who believed that I could play Mame. I started teaching her It's Today, the opening number, and if he walked into my life. I thought the contrast between those two numbers would show everything that, that, that she needed. It gave me great confidence. Because if he felt I could do it, then I thought, well, um, if he thinks I can do it, I can do it. I made her a tape, and I said, go to bed with this tape in your ear, and I'll meet you tomorrow morning, and we'll, we'll go over it once more. Jerry was absolutely adamant that I, that I impress them with my prowess as a singer and also to act the role. And so he said, look, what I'm going to do is I'm going to play the piano for you. And she walked out on stage with her mink and threw it on a chair in a wonderfully uh, 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 dramatic and, 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 <laughs> and theatrical gesture. And she heard this arpeggio, and she went, light the candles. Get the eyes out, roll the rug up, it's today. The most exciting thing in the world. And Jerry was overjoyed. I mean, you never knew anybody who was more supportive of an actress at that moment than Jerry. It was a lovely thing to see a great actress emerge as a great musical star. She became the, the darling of Broadway musicals, and she won four Tony Awards, two in shows of mine, Mame and Dear World. Jerry's next three shows, Dear World, Mac and Mabel, and The Grand Tour, were not considered successful, so the decade of the 70s was difficult. But everything changed one day when Jerry went to the movies. I went to see a film called La Caja Fall, at a little art theater with my friend Chuck. And I walked out of that theater into the daylight, and I said, this is going to be my next musical. I won another Tony Award, and I had a five-year run, and it was one of the most joyous experiences I've ever, I've ever lived through. One song from Lacage, I Am What I Am, has become especially meaningful to the gay community. I didn't really know how that song affected the gay community until a gay pride parade, a float, came by. And I Am What I Am was blared out of that float. And everybody in the group that I was in stopped. And I saw people crying. 
and it was one of the great moments of my life, and I had no idea until that moment how, how important that song was. These days, Jerry remains one of the busiest people in show business, traveling the country, speaking to college students about musical theater, buying and completely redesigning houses like this, his current home in Beverly Hills, spending time with his partner Terry Marlar, and writing his next new musical called Miss Spectacular. I follow him implicitly. The, he was handed so many different talents. The range of the man is unbelievable. I don't think Jerry has ever uh, been given the credit that he, that he should have over these many years because he's an extraordinarily good lyricist and he's also a great melody spinner. I mean, there's no question about it. When somebody writes me a letter and, and says, when, when my housework gets too, too overwhelming and when the kids are really, I, I turn my, my MAME album on and I sing We Need a Little Christmas with, with, with Miss Lansbury and I get through the day that way. That letter made me cry because that's the stranger that I made sing the way Irving Berlin made me sing that night that I went to see Anna Get Your Gun. Coming up on In The Life, how one man is giving the world a new perspective on hip hop. The story is a very controversial story about these guys that are into hip hop and are gay but pose as straight. Andy Hum takes you from coast to coast for the latest news in Out and About. And later in Outtakes, Harvey Firestein has something on his mind. Heterosexuals are a thing of the past like Britney Spears, Andrew Lloyd Webber, and Ron Reagan Jr. James Arthur Baldwin is commonly acknowledged to have been one of the most important literary voices of the African-American civil rights era. A proud black gay man and a gifted author, James Baldwin has written many works, including Go Tell It on the Mountain and Other Country, and the internationally celebrated book on homosexual love, Giovanni's Room. I'm Paris Barkley, and you're watching In the Life. In 1992, Whitney Houston's I Will Always Love You topped the charts. The Crying Game was a surprise hit at the box office, and Bill Clinton became the first Democratic president in 12 years. It was also the year that a man named John Scagliotti had an idea for a news and entertainment show that gays and lesbians could call their very own. And he named it In the Life. It seemed that the broadcasting apologists are hiding behind Big Bird, Mr. Rogers, and Masterpiece Theater, laying down their quality smokescreen while they shovel out funding for gay and lesbian variety shows. Well, they didn't exactly shovel out the funding, but in 1992, the show's creator found enough support from the New York State Council on the Arts and WNYC-TV in New York City. In the Life premiered as a bi-monthly variety show on just six PBS stations, becoming the first show of its kind to reach out to the gay and lesbian community. Now, I know a lot of you are thinking, gosh, not another show on gays and lesbians on television. Comic and satirist Kay Clinton came on board as host, and the show featured performances by groups like Castleberry Dupre and their harmonious flirtations. These were some of the top acts on the gay entertainment scene at the time. We want a Superman like Christopher Reeve. As the first season progressed, newscaster Garrett Glazier, comedian Karen Williams, and playwright and actor Charles Bush came on board to host. You know, Miss Dale, this is a show devoted to gay and lesbian culture. Oh, really? You mean this isn't American movie classics? In the spring of 1993, there was no greater gay and lesbian event than the March on Washington, an event so important that we left our home base of New York and did the entire show amidst a celebration and protest in our nation's capital. It was a wonderful time, celebrities and parties, singing and dancing, communion and reunion. But the heart and mind of the 1993 March on Washington was on something serious and far-reaching gay and lesbian civil rights. This monumental event propelled In the Life to take a more journalistic approach in serving the gay and lesbian community, and we officially became a news magazine. And I officially came on board as co-host. In the Life's purpose is to bring discussions of gay culture and identity to a national audience. So in keeping with our new format, we introduced one-on-one -on -one interviews with some of the nation's leading playwrights, pundits, and performers. 
don't negate my experiences just because they may not fit in your form. We were also there to cover another milestone event in gay and lesbian culture, New York's historic Stonewall 25 celebration. That year's Pride Month also included the Gay Games, bringing thousands of gay athletes from all over the world. Okay, some more talented than others. Gay Games, did you play anything this week or watch uh, anything? I did not have my event. And? It was channel surfing. Amidst the celebrations, there was a poignant tribute to all those lost to AIDS. The third season marked a new era for In the Life as the series honed in on diversity, politics, and issue-oriented programming. We open the door for a variety of voices to be heard. Like racism, homophobia is not always pinpointable. You can't always tell when it's happening or who it's coming from. You just know that there's something wrong. In our fourth season, we traveled halfway around the world to Beijing, China, to cover the United Nations World Conference on Women. Here, lesbian activists were helping educate women from many countries on issues of sexuality and human rights. I was really curious, you know, about this lesbianism. In India, we don't, we have, uh, I mean, we don't know, we don't know much about lesbianism. Here, I learned, I learned that it's something natural, no? But we never ignored the issues in our own backyard, and we were there to cover the strong gay and lesbian presence at the 1996 Republican National Convention. Does the RNC hear us? Probably not. But will we be discouraged? No way! Our sixth season began with a hard-hitting report on the ex-gay movement, the first in a series that explored the radical rights assault on gay and lesbian civil rights. We're here, we're ex-queer, get used to it. I support you, okay. but I need you to support me in being happy and being who I am, even if I want to do that forever. That season, we not only stayed close to hard-hitting issues here in the U.S., but we also went global, producing our most ambitious show ever by visiting three continents and five countries. Hong Kong is such a hybrid uh, kind of society because uh, there is this uh, influence from Western culture and also this long history of Chinese traditional values. Battled the windy Pacific, fought off a hurricane. In the following seasons, In the Life continued to develop its roster of correspondents, as well as its commitment to reporting issues of civil rights and social justice. I've always appreciated librarians, but never quite so fully as when my, my book suddenly got into the news. They're truly the foot soldiers of the First Amendment. In the Life not only stayed tuned to the gay and lesbian experience, we also broke new ground by covering issues relevant to the transgender community. It is kind of shocking and confusing for people that, you know, here, um, uh, I was a heterosexual man, man and now I'm a, a woman and still chasing women that, you know, huh, where's that come from? So that's confusing to people. By the new millennium, In the Life had garnered critical acclaim, and many celebrities lent their face and name to our series with public service announcements. You're watching the Emmy Award-nominated gay and lesbian news magazine, In the Life. True story. This year, Harvey Firestein joined In the Life as our very own resident commentator. Now in its 10th season, In the Life continues to evolve, and we remain committed to providing award-winning journalism reporting the issues, concerns, and interests important to gays and lesbians everywhere. Hello, I'm Susan Sarandon. I'm Dan Butler. I'm Elon Harris. I'm Jerome McClanahan. Hi, I'm Terrence McNally. This is my mother. I'm Wilson Cruz. I'm Martina Navratilova. Patricia Clarkson. I'm Matthew St. Patrick. I'm Edward Alden. I'm Kate Clinton. Margaret Cho. I'm Alan Ball. And you're watching. You're watching. And you're watching. And you're watching America's Gay and Lesbian. Gay and Lesbian News Magazine. In the Life. In the Life. In the Life. In the Life. Happy anniversary. Happy anniversary. Happy 10th anniversary. Congratulations on your 10th season in the Life. protests to praise from awards to anniversaries. Gays the word this June as we scour the nation for news, events, and celebrations. I'm Andy Hum, and this is In the Life's 10th Anniversary Edition. 
of Out and About. In the news, Topeka demagogue Fred Phelps continues to hold his hate protests at the most inappropriate of occasions, including a recent appearance in New York City. Fred Phelps and his family were in town protest the FDNY because he believes that September 11th was God's punishment for homosexuality in New York City. A crass act, to say the least, but it turns out the joke is now on Phelps. Ever clever gay groups have found a new way to organize and profit from Phelps' notoriety. And what you do is every time Fred Phelps and his family visit your area, you get everybody together to uh, pledge X amount of dollars, like a dollar a minute, five dollars. From Bellingham to Brooklyn, gay activists are reeling in the dollars for every minute the Reverend Phelps and his cohorts hold their protest vigils. To date, over $50,000 has been raised to benefit gay groups nationwide. The Victory Fund is the leading national political organization that recruits, trains, and supports lesbian and gay candidates. The fund is steaming ahead towards the upcoming November elections, backing a roster of over 50 candidates, hoping to join the ranks of the nation's 220 out elected officials or a variety of gay and lesbian office seekers. Welcome to the second Roth for County Commissioner volunteer meeting. In Oklahoma, Jim Roth is running to become that state's first out county commissioner. In Maine, Susan Longley, daughter of former Governor James Longley, is hoping to join the three current out Congress members by winning a seat in the U.S. House of Representatives. Peter Moraga is vying to become an Arizona state representative. And in North Carolina, recently out and proud candidate Sharon Thompson is setting her sights on that state's House of Representatives. Since its inception, the Victory Fund has raised over $3 million to help elect gays and lesbians to public office. Chicago was the place to be this April for the fourth annual Reaching Out Convention, the nation's only gay-dedicated recruitment event specifically for job-seeking MBAs. Some 20 leading corporations set up shops specifically to meet and greet more than 400 gay and lesbian potential masters in business administration. San Francisco's new gay center opened its doors in early March. These are the people who made it happen. Built as a collaboration between 40 different organizations, the center's opening weekend included galas, politicos, and all manner of festivity. It's estimated that the new center will serve over 48,000 clients from the Bay Area each year. On the culture front, GLAAD, the Gay and Lesbian Alliance Against Defamation, celebrated spring by hosting their 13th annual Media Awards. Stars, nominees, and supporters, gay and straight, gathered at three ceremonies nationwide to honor those who have best represented lesbians and gays in the media. Kristen Johnston hosted the New York show, which included tributes to special honorees Nathan Lane and Glenn Close. And I have had a certain experiences in my life um, the Greta Kammermeyer story that I did, in the gloaming that I did, that were, were very meaningful to me. Alan Ball, the advocate, and Shirley MacLaine were honored at the Los Angeles ceremonies, while Sandra Bernhardt and Brooke Shields received accolades at the San Francisco show. After 14 years honoring the finest in gay and lesbian literature, this year's Lambda Literary Awards took a turn for the spicier. This year, they have added a category for erotica and romance. Ms. Taramino hosted a pre-event reading in Lower Manhattan, giving assembled fans a taste of what's in store on the women's side. A real-life strip club. I've been dreaming of just such a place for years, but had never worked up the courage to actually go to one. Later, at the Lambda Literary Awards ceremony, Margaret Cho was the guest of honor, receiving the Building Bridges Award. Other Lammy winners this year included Achi Obejas for Best Lesbian Fiction and The Greatest Taboo, Homosexuality in Black Communities for Best Essay. Despite a laundry list of obstacles to gay adoption, America is in the midst of a gaby boom. Okay, so here's our family, okay? And In the Life's own segment producer, Johnny Simons, has chronicled his and his partner's journey into parenthood with his new documentary, hey. Daddy and Papa. It's our new reality. That's right. Hey, cutie pie. As Daddy and Papa demonstrates, gay men are challenging common notions of family, interracial relationships, marriage, and child rearing. The documentary takes a fresh approach in exploring the potential minefields and fields of gold that await prospective father-father couples. As In the Life celebrates its 10th anniversary, a pause is in order to recognize some of the many other important anniversaries, starting with the pioneering media outlet, The Advocate. 
to actually start to communicate through 12 mimeograph pages 35 years ago. Long before Ellen DeGeneres did a one-page Q&A and wound up on the cover of Time magazine, the Advocate was the only place that you could go and tell your story. Other anniversaries being celebrated include the Los Angeles Gay and Lesbian Center that recently had its 30th anniversary. While on the opposite coast, New York's gay men's health crisis celebrates its 21st year of serving clients in the New York metro area. Pride Fest America in Philadelphia, the nation's premier lesbian and gay cultural festival, turns 10 this year, while Interpride, the organization devoted to promoting gay, lesbian, bisexual, and transgender pride on an international level, turns 21. Body Positive in New York City celebrates its 15-year anniversary as an AIDS service organization, and in Los Angeles, Congregation Beth Chaim Hadashim is celebrating 30 years as the world's first gay and lesbian synagogue. The New York City Police Gay Officers Action League, or GOAL, has been blazing trails for 20 years, and Gala Choruses, the umbrella organization for more than 170 choruses nationwide, soars into its 21st year of existence. PFLAG, Parents and Friends of Lesbians and Gays, turns 30 this year, having first met in a church hall back in 1973. And Lambda Legal Defense also marks an amazing 30 years of activism. Happy 17th anniversary to AMFAR, the AIDS research group, and their founding national chairwoman, Elizabeth Taylor. And congrats to ACT UP, the original AIDS activist group who turned 16 this year. And rounding up our anniversary salute is Southern California's largest LGBT arts and film festival, OutFest, which turns 20 years old this year. You can log on to inthelifetv.org to find links to many of the organizations that we profiled this month. I'm Andy Hum, and you've been out and about. Emil Wilbekin has a remarkable story. As a gay African American, he seems an unlikely champion of hip hop music, which is often seen as homophobic. But as editor in chief of Vibe magazine, which was founded by Quincy Jones in 1993, Emil is using his position to educate the world about the true guts and glory of this urban music. It's about the superstars of urban music. He wants to tell the stories that exist behind hip hop. The drama, the politics, sexual identity. Some people feel like being gay is, is a challenge. Hip hop music has definitely been known to be homophobic. That's probably why people in the hip hop community are not open about it. There are also all these beautiful positive things about hip hop. All I need is one mic. I'm Emil Wilbekin, editor-in-chief of Vibe magazine. Quincy came up with the idea for an urban music and culture magazine that would be multicultural, not just about music, but about the arts and film and politics. And it would be young, and it would be beautiful, and it would be cutting edge. As editor-in-chief of a magazine, you are the face of the magazine, so you have to represent the magazine. You have to come up with the content with your team of editors, making sure that the magazine is balanced and fair, making sure that the magazine sells on newsstands. I grew up in Cincinnati, Ohio, which is a very, you know, big urban city, but it's also very conservative. I always felt like something was different or uh, unique about me. I had won awards for art shows in kindergarten, and I won my first uh, writing essay contest in the third grade. So there were always these things that kind of set me apart. I remember wanting to have my own magazine, and my goal in my head was to be the editor-in-chief of my own magazine by the time I was 30, and to be a millionaire by the time I was 30. So I became editor-in-chief of Vibe when I was 31, and I'm still working on the millionaire part. But, um, so you know how in the beginning of the Mary Tyler Moore show, she's in Minneapolis and she throws her hat in the air. That's how I felt when I came to New York. I was really, really excited. I felt like I was finally home. In the early 90s, when I was working at Metropolitan Home, I was introduced to a couple of editors from other magazines who happened to be gay. And they very much encouraged me to come out and to be honest with myself and my friends and my family as to who I was. I remember being a nervous wreck and like butterflies in my stomach and my hands sweating all day. And I called home and I remember just kind of saying like, mom and dad, I'm gay. And 
My mother just started crying and screaming and saying, no, 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 please, Lord, no. And my father said that he kind of had an idea, which was kind of surprising to me. Even though the time was very difficult with my family and it was very, you know, emotionally just hard, I definitely felt a huge weight lifted off my shoulders by being honest with them. When I started at Vibe Magazine in 92, I was associate editor. He's held every single position at the magazine, whether it's taking care of the next section, which is our new talent section, fashion director, I mean, everything. When I was considering if I would go after the Vibe editor-in-chief job, I definitely in my head thought about the homophobia in hip hop and the misogyny and the perceived small-mindedness of the hip-hop community. But then I also thought about the fact that I would have the power to change those perceptions and open up people's eyes. Mill's got a very calm attitude and a very honest kind of um, approach that allows him to be critical, to make choices that are uncomfortable, and to make artists uncomfortable when necessary, to tell the truth to keep his integrity, and there's a tremendous amount of respect for him in our industry. There was a rapper who was playing his album for us for consideration for a cover, and one of the songs came on, and I'm there with my music editor and one of my writers, and the song is like faggot and beat you down and, and kill the faggots and da 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 da, and he realized it and jumped up and looked at me and was like, I'm so sorry, I really apologize, and turned the song off. I called the record label the next day and I was very, very, you know, disappointed with the fact that that was being considered for the album because I felt like that is not the types of messages that we should be putting out in the music right now. The song did not make the album. I think what makes him a great leader is that he really pays attention to people. I think that's very important when you are um, selling a magazine to many people in the world and when you are um, acknowledging and recognizing different artists, you have to really get into what people want and what people like. One story that I really, really felt impassioned about was doing a gay hip hop story. No one really knew how to kind of go about it and do it in a way that would be sort of not offensive, let's say, to our, you know, non-gay readers, that they would find this interesting, and at the same time, that the gay readers would feel like this was representing them. I was going out to these clubs in New York and D.C. and Atlanta and Los Angeles and Miami that were hip-hop clubs. All these kids were thugged out with the gold chains and the gold teeth and corn rolls and just, you, you name any rapper, there was a look-alike there of that person. The fact is, these clubs were gay. The story is a very controversial story about these guys that are into hip-hop and are gay but pose as straight and don't are not out. And then it also talks about the conflict of loving music that is, you know, degrading and that is self-deprecating and that is homophobic. We got more letters from this story than any other story published in the history of the magazine. Most of them positive, most of them kids from Oklahoma or, you know, down south who were thankful for us for writing the story because it represented them. And then some of the letters were from gay black men who were mad that I outed them, that I outed the culture. I realized that, you know what, this is a very hot topic and obviously we have a lot of gay readers or people who are interested in gay culture. So it was kind of, it was very rewarding. Neil brings uh, just in his person uh, the tendency to strive for excellence. He has intuitive sense for really what's hot uh, with a particular genre or a particular artist, and also uh, a real finger on the pulse in terms of what's driving the culture. I still have a lot of work at Vibe that I want to do. There's still a lot of stories that haven't been told. There's still a lot of education and cultural awareness that needs to happen. I was reading the book Borrowed Time, an AIDS memoir. I finished it and I turned to my husband and I said, I have to know Paul Manette. I have to meet him. So I called my agent and I said, how can I find Paul Manette? He said, he's dating a friend of yours. So I called my friend Stephen Kolzak, who Paul was dating at the time, and I said, Stephen, you're inviting me over for dinner. 
and uh, he did. And um, we got to know Paul, and he became family. And um, then when he won the National Book Award, we threw a party at our house for him, and we rented a, a throne and a, a crown and a scepter. <laughs> we have a picture of him sitting on the throne. And um, then in 1995, he died uh, February 10th, the day after my birthday, which I thought was very considerate of him. And uh, in May, we did the California AIDS ride in his memory. And um, he's still in my heart. I'm Judith Light, and you're watching In the Life. In tonight's outtakes, Harvey Forestine proves that you can go home again. Are we ready? Is everybody in place? Props. That seems logical. On a perfect spring day, I made a pilgrimage to the neighborhood of my youth, Park Slope, Brooklyn, New York. It had always been a family-friendly area. Tree-lined avenues choked with bustling school-bound kids, mommies guiding strollers, daddies chasing toddlers, nannies pushing swings. 20 years had not changed a thing except who the hell was guiding them strollers, chasing them toddlers, pushing them swings? It was us, lesbians and gay males, parenting as far as the eye could see. I began to worry, well, not about the new breeding role of homosexuals, but about usurping the usefulness of straights. I mean, now that we procreate with ease, are heterosexuals obsolete? Years ago, sociobiologist Edward O. Wilson put forth his theory that homosexuals are absolutely necessary for the survival of the species. He held that if homosexuality were not, it surely would have been bred out millions of years ago via natural selection. So why are we here? We are the teachers who can stay late after school to aid slower students. We're the maiden aunts and bachelor uncles who provide financial cushioning in case of emergencies. We are, in his view, the worker bees of humanity. In a more recent book, The Soul Beneath the Skin, David Nimmons holds that we are a superior society altogether. We are, he asserts, the social and moral leaders of humanity. Using the AIDS crisis as backdrop, he sets out to illustrate that we are more nurturing, altruistic, nonviolent, and even in the face of death, fun-loving. <laughs> Gays and lesbians are more open-minded and more available for intimate relationships, not only with partners, but also with family and friends. Our volunteerism alone elevates us high above straight society. W has no need to beg us to do our part. There is certainly no argument against our claim as artistic and cultural leaders of humanity. Without us, heterosexual wardrobes would break down into two major categories, fig leaves and grape leaves. All anyone needs to do is take a look at the art, architecture, and home furnishing trends from the mid-80s through the late 90s. You will find evidenced a vast black hole of invention. When we lost a generation of gay men to the horror of AIDS, the world missed an entire chapter of fashion, music, art, and style. Oh, you don't believe me? Get out your back issues of Vogue, Architectural Digest, and Rolling Stone. So, given our place as the innovators, protectors, teachers, and keepers of peace, what role do heterosexuals play in society beyond warriors and tractor pull drivers? Procreators? Us too. So, if that's all they have to offer, who needs them? Keeping straight people around just to breed is like keeping that old office clunker that prints those curly faxes. I mean, why bother when you can get a machine that is a printer, plain paper, fax, scanner, and answering machine all in one beautiful package? Heterosexuals, nothing but one trick ponies. I'm telling you, friends, heterosexuals are a thing of the past like Britney Spears, Andrew Lloyd Webber, and Ron Reagan Jr. So again, I ask you, do we need them? Of course we do. They're our kids. Besides, if there were no heterosexuals, who would play us on TV? I'm Catherine Linton. For all of us at In The Life, thank you for watching, and we'll see you next month.
In the Life is funded in part by the H. Van Ameringen Foundation. Additional support provided by the Gill Foundation, the Pride Foundation, the Ted Snowden Foundation, the Otto Haas Charitable Trust, the Collingwood Foundation, the Reed Williams Foundation, William J. Resnick, Michael A. Levin, Richard Winger Fund of Stonewall Community Foundation, and the annual support of In the Life members like you.